Amazing, our, our worship and our prayers is like incense going up. That's what the, the Word of God says. And so when we sing that line, you know, we're, we're saying may our prayers and worship go up to God all day, all night, our whole life, may it all be worship, you know. God is good. Woo! I sometimes just want to do a, a sermon on the songs we sing and explain them, you know what I mean? Because they're just, God is good. God is so good, and he hears the cries of our heart. Amen. Amen. Has anyone seen the old game show? It's funny. I, I f- I'm getting to a stage of my life now where I feel like when I say things to people, I'm like, have you heard of this? They're like, no. I'm like, oh, man, I'm old, you know? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that, that point. Has anyone seen the game? Don't worry, about millennials, just, just block your ears out for a second. But has anyone else seen the game show, The Price is Right? Yeah, yeah, see, see, millennials are like, what is that? YouTube it, find some joy in your life, it's amazing. My wife crushed it, that game. My wife absolutely crushed it. And uh, when she gets back from shopping, you know, I feel like I play this game weekly. Because she gets home and she's like, guess how much? Guess how much this is? And I'm like, this is not the price is right, you know. Because my wife is extremely good at bargain hunting. Like, extremely good. I just go into shops and I just buy everything with a yellow sticker, you know? Thinking that the yellow stickers are the cheapest. But apparently they're not. It's all a sales gimmick. And I have a marketing degree. It's crazy, <laughs> you know? And my wife's like, that wasn't the cheapest, right? And so everything she pays, pays for, it's always worth it. It's always worth it because she's always finding the bargain, right? And then on the flip side, have you ever overpaid for something and you're like, that is definitely not worth it? You know, the first time we went to Movie World... And I went to get lunch, and they're like, yes, you can buy a burger for $46. I was like, sorry? Maybe it wasn't $46, but it was like 25 bucks. And it was this burger patty that had been there for three weeks, slopped into, like, I don't know, in between this bun, this stale bun. And they're like, thank you very much, you know. And you're like, man, 100 bucks is cheap to go to the theme park. It's not 100 bucks, I tell you. It's like $400 because you've got to pay for your food. You've got to pay for everything, you know, buy your kids stuff on the way out and, and I'm just like, this cheeseburger is not worth it, you know. And I got me thinking, what is worth it? What about dying? <laughs> that brought the mood down, didn't it? What about dying? What is dying, what is worth dying for? We know what Jesus thought was worth dying for and that was you, which we know brought him glory because he was the only one that could do it. Amen. That's why it brings him glory because he's the only one that could have gone to the cross. But make no mistake, you were worth dying for. And our big question today, the title of the message is called, Is It Worth It? Is It Worth It? And you can change, the interchange that little it for anything in your life. And my hope is that today we will understand everything we do, everything we do in our life, we ask ourselves, is it worth it? And we answer it with yes because you then choose to do it. Does that make sense? People say, I don't have any time. No, no, you have plenty of time. What you don't have is the right priorities, because everyone has the same amount of time. And, um, you know, we went through this with our young guys, and we say, instead of saying, oh, I just didn't have time for that, just change your language to that wasn't my priority. And it's amazing what that will highlight for you in your life. And today we're talking about, is it worth it? What is worth doing in this life for you? Woo, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Oh, it's good. I feel it's good already. All right, we are in a sermon series called The Almighty and All of Us. And what we're doing is we're going through uh, our values as a church and how we're partnering up with God to take back the kingdom of darkness for God and for his glory in the vast region and how that looks like. And if you are here, if you're new, if you're visiting, I just want to encourage you that God has a message for you. Don't switch off now and be like, oh, they're going through their internal church stuff. God can't say anything to me. God is bigger than that. Amen. And he has a word for you. I mean, when we when were in announcements, like, and, I, and this is not for condemnation, but I don't know if I heard it the same way that you heard it, but two million children took a discipleship course for Christ. Amen. 
and everyone's still nodding at me, that deserves some praise. Amen. Send some incense up to the Lord Almighty for what he is doing. And if you think for one second that you can sit here and God does not have something for your heart that is going to change you for your good and his glory, you have another thing coming. Amen. And that is going to be conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you just have to go, yes, Lord, I want it today and I want it every day and I just want to be changed for your glory because of what you did for me on the cross. Amen. Woo! And that's it. The sermon is finished. Today we're going to unpack the value. It's one of our values, one of my favorite values. We will do anything. We will do anything short of sin to reach people for Christ. To reach people no one is reaching, we're going to have to do things no one is doing. I have a picture. I have a picture for us. It's a super fun picture, right? (laughs) And my question for you is what do you see in the picture? What sort of person do you see this picture being about? And some of you, if we're honest, we'll go straight to judgment. We'll go straight to judgment. We'll say, this guy, man, this guy has some money. He's obviously in America because he's got some American money or maybe just visited there because I couldn't find a picture with Australian money. Yes, there's a made-up picture. Please run with me with this, okay? (laughs) He spent it on alcohol, right? And if you look closely, you can see he's got a pocket Bible there, right? Um, He's got some sugar there for his coffee. I don't know what that is. Why are people laughing? It's got a, uh, one of our church bands in the picture as well. So he obviously came to our opening day, right? And you might be like, man, church ain't helping this guy. You know, <laughs> he's come obviously and it's not doing him much good. You know, what a sinner. He's got some metallic, I don't know what that is on the left-hand side there. You know, what I see, what I see is maybe, maybe, Maybe he, someone has offered him a Bible at some point in his life and he said yes to that Bible. Amen. Amen. I see someone down in their situation. Maybe they're currently making poor choices in their life. Maybe they are struggling, which they're dosing with alcohol and sugar, you know, uh, instead of coming to Christ. But I see someone that is searching. I see someone that is searching for an answer, someone that is dosing their pain in maybe the wrong things, but there is an internal struggle here, amen. There is an internal struggle. There is a sinner here that is making poor choices in a tough situation, and I see someone that is one decision away from becoming a new creation, amen. I see someone that is one decision away from going from death to life. Amen. That they are one decision away from being convicted by the Holy Spirit and saying, Lord Jesus, I choose you. And I see a person that Jesus came and died for. That is what I see when I see this picture. I see a sort of person that we would welcome in this church that we would say, come in and feel the grace of God and feel the mercy and let him transform your life without judgment. Amen. I see someone that we'll give grace to and say, hey man, grace says that you are loved. Grace says that you are a child of God and the truth says that stuff is hurting you. Amen. And there is something better than whatever you're doing, whatever vice this is that you're doing to make yourself feel better. There is something better than that and his name is Jesus Christ. And he doesn't offer you temporary solutions. He offers you permanent life. Amen. So come and feel the grace of God with us and worship in this place. Amen. Jesus did not come for the healthy. He came for the sick. And these people are the sick. Amen. Luke 5, day 2. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. One of our values. We will do anything short of sin, to reach people for Christ. Why? Because it is the mission given to us by our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Where are we going today? We are going to go into a story in Mark, then we're going to learn about a soldier at the end of his life, right? And then we're just going to worship the roof off. Can we do that today? All right. Father God, we pray and we hope that you will open our hearts this morning, Lord, that 
anything that is said from this place, Lord, is, is directly from you, Father God. And so I ask for your Holy Spirit to convict me, Lord, in what to preach and what to leave out, Father, and what to say and what not to say, Father God. Because all we want is you, Father, and all that you are. Wherever we are, Father God, we pray that we can put away distractions, Lord, that we can put away whatever we think that we know, that we can just put away our ego, we can put away our flesh, and we can come to you, Father, wanting to know you more. Reveal your heart to us this morning, Father God. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Woo! Man, it's a bit dangerous doing this sermon before. Well, one of our values is that we are spiritual contributors before, before being spiritual consumers because we know that revival first starts in God's church. Amen? Amen. We know that there are people that are hurting, there are people that are struggling in God's church. Believe it or not, people can have Christ and still struggle. And that's, that's I know it's crazy, right, because we have Christ, you know, and our, our, one of our biggest calls is to actually look after the saints, you know, so it's, but, but God put this on my heart and I just feel like we need to go there and so we're going to do that. Is that okay? If you were to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, right, 1, 2, 3, being super apathetic about bringing people to Christ, not really caring, in your groove, right, or if you're in 6, 7 or 8, right, then you're super excited about bringing people to Christ, if you rate yourself a 9 or a 10 on that scale, then repent because you're not, right? <laughs> <laughs> and pride is the biggest killer, right? If you're a six, seven, or eight, then you are excited about leading people to Christ, right? You're one of those people that are like, yes, I'm praying for people's salvation. I took someone to church last week. I'm mentioning it to everyone I know. Like, I am excited, right? If you're on the lower end of the scale, right, you might have never led someone to Christ in your life. Uh, if you examine the last seven days of your prayer life, you weren't praying for anyone that doesn't know Christ, and I don't say that to condemn you or to make you feel guilty. I say that to let's just bring it to the light and it is what it is. Amen? It is what it is. And so if that's what it is for you, let's just address it, right? Because we can't just want to bring people to Jesus. We must bring people to Jesus. It's a great command. It's not something that is an optional extra in our walk, right? It is something that we must do. If you know, the, if, you had, if you had a winning lotto ticket and you knew the numbers, right, and you're like, hey, Josh, man, don't tell anyone, but this thing is rigged, right, and I know the lottery numbers for next week, and these are the numbers, let's just split it between us two, right? You would share it with someone because of how good it is. And so when we know and understand the love of Christ is not something that we just want to do as an optional extra. It's something that we need to do because of what's been done in our heart and what's been done in us. Amen? Amen? All right, let's do it. Let's go to Mark's Gospel. All right, the context. Jesus is preaching, right? He's preaching. He's, he's just doing a sermon. It's great. He's in a house. There's a great crowd. We all know this story. Mark 2, 3 to 4. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. So they're on the roof. They removed the roof. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. So there's, there's these guys and they brought this paralyzed man to this house to see Jesus and they couldn't get in. And so they walked him up on the roof. They dug open the roof and they lowered him down. Right? And so what's happening? There's this whole house. I think I've got a picture of this house. Right, these are like the old Jewish houses. I think it's maybe a bit bigger, I don't know. And there's a door there. They didn't have doors, there was a door there. And everyone is sitting there in the house listening to Jesus like this. Like, yeah, Jesus, you're amazing. And there's some guys that are trying to bring this paralyzed man to Jesus, trying to get in, and they couldn't get in. They couldn't get in. Could you imagine? Everyone's like, Oh, Jesus is Jesus, you're amazing. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse, excuse. No, Jill, that's amazing. Oh, whoa. You know, and so they had to walk up these stairs and lower him down the, the top of the roof, right? And I did a bit of research on what is made of this roof, and it's like this dirt stuff, sticks, and manure. I'm not kidding. They had to dig through like manure to like lower this person down. Like, 
So could you imagine like there's Jesus in there, these guys carry this man up and they're digging this roof and they're lowering him down. Like, I don't even know, how, how did they lower him down? You know, how did they do that? Everyone's like, oh, I've seen The Chosen, go watch it. No, right? <laughs> so I'm lowering it down. He's like, all right, a little bit lower. No, no, you, you a little bit. Oh, just, just drop him. I mean, what? He's already paralyzed. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> Why did they do that? Because these men just had to get this guy to Jesus. They just had to get this person to Jesus. And no matter what, they had to get this person to Jesus. They're like, this man is paralyzed. We've heard what Jesus can do. And at any cost, we're going to get him to Jesus. What do we need to know to reach people? What do we need to do to reach people? First thing, bear some burdens. Man, I could or everyone's like, I got my own burdens. Don't give me any more burdens. I, I can't even carry my own burden, let alone carry someone else's burden. We care for those that are in hurt or need in our lives. You want to reach people for Christ? It starts with love. It starts with love. First in God's church and then out there, Galatians. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Do you know what the Greek translation for everyone is? Everyone. It's really annoying. <laughs> and especially, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Especially those that call themselves Christians. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. Look what they did. Some men carried him. Don't lose the weight of this, right? They didn't go to them and say, hey man, Jesus is in town, you should get up and walk. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus is in town, you should go see him. They didn't go to him and say, hey man, this guy's amazing. We'll, if, we get a, if, we, if we get hold of him, we'll tell him to pop by. Okay? No, no, no. They got involved in this person's life. They must have been involved in this person's life. I say this with as much love as I can, but drive-by witnessing just, it does not work, right? Well, you're like, what's a drive-by? Because, you know, I'm Christian as well. I polish my holiday. I don't know what a drive-by is, you know. They didn't, they didn't drive by and wind down their window and say, hey, man, Jesus loves you. Woo! And if you're doing that, please keep doing it because it's great. Or if you're on the mean side of the spectrum, you might roll down your window and go, turn or burn, you know. <laughs> it does not work. People need to know that you care. And some people go, I can't speak to someone about the Bible, man. I don't even know anything about the Bible. You don't need to know anything about the Bible. You need to know something about love. Don't worry about your knowledge. Worry about your relationship with Christ. Don't worry about... Oh, what if they ask me a big question? No, 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 no. Just love. You don't need to know a lot. You need to love a lot. Amen. But you don't know what they did. You're right. I don't know what they did. I don't know what they did. But Jesus came and put himself on a cross for what you did. And because of that, we can go love someone unconditionally. Because that's what Jesus offers you when you repent. And so we can love others. We can love others. Amen? Amen. We can love a lot. We are with people. We bear their burdens. We talk. We care. And we earn the right to be heard. We earn the right to be heard. We have a guy in our church, I was going to put a picture up, up of him, but I feel like that would have been too embarrassing. But everyone knows Tony Heritage, and he's absolutely... <laughs> Sorry, Tony. He's absolutely amazing. And this story, I've actually changed the name and, and changed the activity for, for privacy concerns. But I just remember I was around at his house one day. And I mean, man, this guy has a heart for Jesus, you know, and, and he often says to me, was I too blunt? And I'm like, man, just be you, bro. 
I wish I could be that blunt, you know. And he just has a heart for Jesus. And I was around in his place one day and we we're trying to work out this sermon illustration. And I said, Oh, what are you doing? And he's like, Oh, I'm just going to go take this guy, Steve, and I'm going to take him rock climbing, right? And I was like, What do you mean? And he's like, Yeah, I'm just going to go out with him and we're just going to talk. And, and, and yeah, he really needs someone to talk to. And he went out and he spoke to this person and then he told me what they spoke about. And man, I was like, Whoa. Like, it wasn't enough just to give this guy a call. It wasn't enough just to slap him down with the truth. But he took time out of his day to go do an activity together where this guy opened up. And, I mean, it wasn't rock climbing, but if it was and the guy did something wrong, he'd probably just push him off. But, you know, but he, he got to know and listen to this person's heart, right? And then he delivered, he earned the right through repeated activity to deliver some truth to this person. And I know by all accounts that this truth was actually taken on really well. And and because of that, this person has a relationship with Christ and is continuing to have a relationship with Christ just because Tony decided, I'm actually going to take time out of my day to do an activity with this person that is struggling instead of saying, hey, mate, bucker up. First, I'm going to take you out. Then I'm going to tell you, hey, mate, bucker up. (laughs) Amen. But Tony had earned the right to have this conversation with someone. And that story absolutely blessed my heart. Amen? Amen? This is happening. We, we are with people. We are activating with people. We are bur- bearing their burdens and we earn the right to be heard. To change someone's perspective, you have to get a seat at their table. So often we are across the road ditching stones at their house and telling them how bad their sin is and how awful they are when we, we don't even want to sit down and try and hear their hearts and, and change their perspective. To change someone's perspective, you need a seat at their table. What did Jesus do? You're looking at me like, oh, but you don't know how bad their sin is. What did Jesus do? He sat and ate with the sinners. And these were the people that were outwardly sinning. These were not the people that were like, because remember, before Jesus came, we're all sinners. So when it says sinners in the Bible, these were the people at the table with the sugar and the alcohol that were outwardly sinning. And Jesus says, hey, man, there's a better way. Let's eat together. And I'm going to tell you all about it. Amen. Most of us are so scared about sitting at the table. Most of us don't even want to sit. We're like, no way, not with that guy. Do you know what that guy did? There is no way. Get a seat at the table. Get a seat at the table. And if you need someone to talk to, pull out a chair at your table and offer someone to come and sit down. Don't sit at your table and eat alone. Pull out the chair and say, hey man, I actually just need someone to sit with. I need someone to eat with. I'm really struggling. And it's okay to struggle as a Christian. Please hear me. If you weren't here the last three weeks, (laughs) go watch them and realise it's okay to struggle as a Christian. Amen? What were they doing? The men got there. The men got to this house and they're all sitting there clapping. Come on, Jesus. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, Jesus, you're the one. You're the one. Je- yeah, Jesus, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, that's a good sauce. Oh, that's a nugget. That is a nugget. I've got my nugget. And now I can just go home and I've got my nugget and I'm all good. Worship the Lord. I wish this service would finish soon because I've got lunch plans. Uh, I've, got, I've got my nugget. and I've, Woo! Woo! One person had to turn. One person had to turn and see this man that was paralysed. One person at the door. If one person turned, there was no need to go up on the, on the roof. If one person had any idea what was going on outside their holy huddle, they wouldn't have to go up on the roof. This is my encouragement. Let's be a church that turns. 
Let's be a church that turns. Let's not be a church that is so engrossed with what is happening in our own circles and we don't turn to see the need in our church. I'm not even talking about the need out there right now. I'm talking about the need right here. Amen. Let's be a church. That's this mystery dinner, I, I, I encourage you to go. Just meet someone that you may not have a, 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 a huge relationship with because God may have given you a gift perfect for that situation and you might go to the mystery guest dinner and you, you might be a person that will be like, man, I just want to be used. I just want to be used. Mystery guest dinner, no. I just want to be used. No, mystery guest dinner. Okay, I'll sign up. And you go to the mystery guest and you're like, man, I don't want to go to this thing. I don't want to meet new people. This is really a lot of energy to meet a new person. And you sit down and they're going through an experience that you have gone through and that you have conquered and that you can speak into. And you be like, man, I'm being used. Amen. Go to the mystery dinner. You might have the antidote for someone else. You might be the one that's hurting that someone else has the antidote for you. Amen. This is not just, I mean, it is about connection and it is about knowing people, but we believe that everything that we do can be used by God for his glory and your freedom. Amen. Don't discourage it. Don't discourage it. Be like, okay, man, I'm all in. I'm going to do it. If God's, if God's on it, I'm going to be on it. Let's be a church that turns. When, when Jesus and Peter were walking towards the, uh, the temple one time in Acts, you know, it says, Acts 3 to 4, they, they saw this lame man that was sitting there and Peter directed his gaze at him. Peter directed, they were on the way somewhere else. They were going to the temple. They didn't have time for this. And yet Peter directed his gaze at him. First thing that Peter, Peter saw, did in this, in this situation, he saw the need. He saw the need. Question, how many needs do you see in your social circles? I'll narrow it down. How many needs do you see in this church, if you were to think right now, top of your head, right now, about your brothers and sisters that are sitting here right now, what issues are there here? Who is struggling? Where am I needed? Who did I pray for in the last seven days? If your answer is none, we have an issue. If your answer is none, we have an issue. I say that in complete and utter love. Let's be a church that turns. Let's be a church that turns and sees. Man, just, just God, Jesus knows the needs in this church. Just pray. But hey, the people that are struggling in our church, please reveal it to me. And if you don't want to reveal it to me, Jesus, just do what you do. Like heal that person. Be there for that person. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters that I rub shoulders with this week. There is someone there that might be struggling, Lord, and I, and I know that my prayers matter and you want my bold prayers, and so I'm just going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for this person, whoever it may be. And God might say, you know, at some point, God might say, ban, it's this person, and he might not. And it would be the biggest privilege in the world if God said, bam, it's this person, and I'm going to use you to heal that situation. Or he might just hear your prayers. And anything you ask for in Jesus' name will be done. Amen. Just start praying for people. Just start praying for people in the congregation. That's it. Okay. First half of the sermon done. So if we're going to bear some burdens, right, and we're going to be a, turn, a church that turns, and we need a seat at the table, what do, we, what do we need to know? This is what we need. There's a few ideas that we need to know, and then we're going home. Right. A few ideas we need to know. This is like the best story in the world. This, like, I'm not talking about the story we're about to go through. I'm talking about the story of Jesus Christ and this kingdom. And you should want to be in this story. You should want to be in this story of God's revival in the Southwest. Amen. What a story to be a part of. Like, what a story. All right, all right, here we go, here we go. So I'm going to talk about Paul. I said a soldier, Paul. Everyone knows who Paul is in the Bible? 
Saul, used to be Saul, met Jesus, turned to Paul, wrote, wrote half the Bible. Everyone knows who Paul is? So he comes to the end of his life, right? He makes it to Rome. He's in Rome. Acts just sort of ends. And then he writes this letter to Timothy. And Timothy is the person that's sort of taking over for him. And he's going to go plant churches. And, and it was Paul's disciple. And so he's writing his last words here before he dies. So this is it. This is, this is it. So this is the end of Paul's amazing life. And he's writing to Timothy about the last bits of his life. We're going to read it. 1 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. Fire. Woo! That's so good. Please open your heart, open your ears if you're asleep. This is it. Awake, O oh sleeper. This is for you. Just pinch yourself, get an elastic band. I don't know, but I'm just excited. All right. Come on. For I am already poured out as a drink offering. That's exciting. Comes the good stuff. I don't care about your martyr. And the time of my departure has come. Woo! Has anyone on their deathbed said, the time of my departure has come? What an amazing mentality of death. Hey man, my time on earth is gone. I'm departing and I'm going somewhere else. I'm not dying. I'm alive. I'm going to eternity. So when I die, I'm just departing. I'm not dying. Good food for thought, right? Amazing. I have fought the good fight. Oh, I just I pray I can say that at the end. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, come on, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You might say, oh, that's a bit cocky, isn't it? Look at the pride in that guy. Romans says, think of yourself as you ought. False humility doesn't help anyone. That's another sermon. What an amazing ending to his life. Surely, like I read this, right? And I'm like, surely, this is a mic drop moment. Like that is a mic drop moment. Will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you have your Bibles open, (laughs) that's not the end of the, the letter. That's not the end of Timothy. The Holy Spirit says, no, 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 no. I want to put some personal instructions in there and some final greetings And I don't know if it ever bugs you, but I'm always like, why? That's a great ending. God, have you ever written a screenplay? You know, because that's it. You don't go on after a romantic comedy couple get married because it always ends badly. You just end there, you know? No, 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 because the Holy Spirit says, if you want to get in this story, I need you to get some ideas. And, And most of it's like, oh, personal instructions, final remarks, let's get on to the next book, it's over, we're going to go through it today. Number one, number one, never mistake visibility for value in making Jesus known. Never mistake visibility for value in making Jesus known. The guys at the back of the house, we've said it, they're at the back of the service, the least important, and yet only one of them had to turn, and they would have given this guy life. Only one of them had to turn. That's it. And in this story, God is looking for availability, not visibility. We've heard it all before, right? God is looking for availability, not visibility. Let's get into the personal remarks, and I'll unpack it for you. 2 Timothy 4, 10 to 11. For Damus, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to skip a couple. For Damus, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus, and Dalmatia, Deal with my pronunciations, okay? Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. When you come, bring the cloak. <laughs> I love it so much. That I left with Carpus at Traus, also the books, and above all the parchments. Do we really need this in the Bible? You are looking at me like I'm a heretic, but this is what goes through my head. I forgot my cloak. Holy Spirit, breathe on this word. <laughs> I keep Holy Spirit, breathe. Because we know that all the scripture is God breathed, right? And so Paul is like, man, I forgot my cloak, breathe. (laughs) Breathe. This is a Holy Spirit word. (laughs) We're going to go through it. Then he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And surely this is the mic drop. Surely this is it. Paul is finished. No, there's more. 
there's final greetings. So now there's personal remarks, and now there's final greetings, right? It's all going to come together. It says, great Prisca and, and Aquila and the household of... Oh, come on. Come, come on. One Cyphus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus, Miletus, Miletus. Trophimus, who was ill, left him. Didn't go back for him. Turns out not everyone got healed. That's funny. 2 Timothy 4, 21 to 22. Do your best to come before winter. Hence the cloak. Eubulus sending... <laughs> Eubulus. Anyone uh, need some, like, baby names? Eubulus. There you go. Eubulus sends greetings to you. So do Pudens and Linus and Claudia... And all the brothers, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And that's the mic drop. Value and visibility do not go hand in hand. Everyone knows Paul, but at the end of the story, there's a lot of people in this story. You go to the last chapter of Romans, and it's Paul just thanking everyone for how much they helped him. And we don't know any of these people you know, except for maybe Priscilla and Aquila, who's, who's in the Bible. But everyone else there, you're like, who is that? Who's that? I think I heard Mark and Luke. They wrote some Gospels, didn't they? They're important. But what about the other people that they mentioned, right? Who were they? They weren't visible, but they had value enough to be in the Holy Spirit, breathed Word of God. And to me, that tells me that's a lot of value. Visibility and value do not go hand in hand. And I want to be clear. Yes, someone is going to get lifted up. Someone is going to get lifted up. Someone is going to get elevated. Someone is going to have lights put on them, right? That is going to happen. But the only way that this value works in our church is that if everyone is in this story, that's the way it works. Is if everyone is in this... And I'm not talking about serving in church. I'm talking about serving the kingdom. I'm talking about a mentality that says, I want to be in this story. I think about when, when, it didn't really happen. But if you're going to go to, like, hospital and have a triple bypass surgery in your heart, you need a specialist for that, right? Like, your mate can be like, hey, man, I can give it a crack, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> you're going to go to a specialist to get that done. And that specialist is probably going to get elevated for, like, what they do. You know what I mean? Like, they're amazing at triple bypass surgeries, and I want the best in the country, and I'm going to go to the person that can do that. But as soon as you sign on that dotted line, and you say, yes, I want this triple bypass surgery done by this doctor, right? There are so many people that you do not see that get pulled into this story, right? The person that takes the parking ticket when you park in the parking lot is now pulled into your story. Every time that you have to go to this hospital for check-ins and the receptionist checks you in, she is pulled into your story. There are nurses, there are anesthesiasts, there are, I don't know, all the other cysts that happen in hospital that are pulled into that story. There are so many more people pulled into that story, not just the doctor that, that, that does the bypass surgery that are in that story to make that story happen. And I'm telling you, you need to get into the story. Just because we don't see what you do, just because we don't see your prayer, just because we don't see the, the love you gave your neighbour, just because we does not mean it's not valuable. It is so valuable in the kingdom of God. Are you available? Are you available? And what do you consider giving your life for? Is this story of Jesus Christ and salvation worth dying for? Is it worth dying for? Two, don't lose sight of the ultimate for the immediate. I can't stress this enough. 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas in love with this world has deserted me. Can you imagine being so close to Paul, this guy who's planting churches, who's going across the country, that's on mission, right? Can you imagine being that close and then all of a sudden you're like, I'm out. I'm checking out of this. I'm checking. And why? Why? 
because of his love with this present world. If I'm honest, I think most of us are here. Most of us are in love with this present world and it's been one of the biggest tricks of Satan forever, not just for us. It's like, man, I've got to, I've got to sort out my, my mortgage and I've got to sort out my money and I've got to sort out this out and I've got to take care of my immediate right now. It is far easier to invest money into something that brings joy right now than give over everything to the ultimate goal. Isn't it? It's so much. Hey, man, it's easier to invest into your retirement now that you might get in 30 years than give over everything to the ultimate goal. And maybe we're pouring into the immediate and we've forgotten the ultimate. We've forgotten eternity. We've forgotten the crown of righteousness. We've forgotten that when we get there, we want Jesus to say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Maybe we've forgotten that the people that we care about that don't know Christ, we've forgotten where they're going. Maybe we've forgotten about the ultimate and we're just dosing with the immediate. Third thing, you cannot buy the lie that your past disqualifies you from getting in this story. You cannot buy the lie that your past disqualifies you from getting in this story. It tells us here, it says, get Mark and bring him with you. You know, like, there's two characters in the Bible, Paul and Barnabas, right? And they had a massive riff. And do you know what it was over? It wasn't over theology, theology, right? It wasn't over like bad odour, right? It wasn't over any of that. It was over Mark deserted them once and Barnabas said, hey, let's bring Mark again. And Paul said, no, not that quitter. I don't want that quitter with us. You bring that quitter and I'm, I'm out. And so Paul and Barnabas, these two friends, they're like, okay, we love each other. We pray for each other. We're going our separate ways. You take Mark the quitter. I don't want him. And Paul just went his separate way and Barnabas went his separate way. But what does this tell us at the end of Paul's life? This tells us that it's somewhere along the line, Mark got back in the story. Mark got back in the story. Paul says, hey, that that quitter, bring Mark back. And Mark is restored right here in the fine print of the Bible in personal remarks. Not, not 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 a mic drop moment. Right, It wasn't like a big glory moment, but God wants you to know that you can get back in the story. You can get back in the It doesn't matter what you've done. You can get back in the story and give God glory. Amen. Like, don't, don't buy the lie. Don't buy. I was so bad. I was so against God. The drugs, the alcohol, the adultery, the things that my sin is too bad. And, and my question for you then is, should we crucify Christ again? If your sin is that bad, if your sin is that bad, that the blood that was shed by Jesus is not enough, or should we just pray and ask him to do it again? The blood is enough. I am begging you, to know in your heart of hearts that your deepest, darkest sin that you have right now, you can bring to the cross right now and be forgiven right now if you repent from it because the blood was enough. The blood was enough. Amen. The blood was enough. It buys you forgiveness. It buys you freedom. And there's too many saints being held on by Satan because of a sin they think that the blood was not enough for. Amen. The blood was enough. Let's not crucify Christ again. Let's not crucify Christ again. There are too many people hanging on to sin that they feel like is too big and that they can't change from and it is a lie from the enemy. It is a lie. What does a church look like that are 
filled by, by the Holy Spirit that are free from their sin because they have repented in humility to our Lord? What does it look like for a church of people to be on fire, free and forgiven? I'll tell you, it's called revival. It's called revival. And it's going to happen in vast. And so my question is, do you want to be a part of that story? Amen. Because we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he is bringing revival to our region. Amen. And I'm telling you, man, if you are sitting there going, I haven't seen anything like that in Australia, then you don't know the God that I know. Amen. Because he is going to bring revival to this region. People will be saved. Amen. Amen. Everyone's like, it sounds all right. It sounds all right. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Get in the story of revival. You are required. You are required. Two more points and we're done. Fourth. Man, God is so good. We understand that no ask is too small because our king is so great. You know, when we put out these huge statements like, we'll do anything short of sin, everyone's like, oh man, they're going to do big things. Would you make someone a cup of coffee? Or is that beneath you? Because anything is the big things and the small things. Verse 13 Go get my cloak. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The Holy Spirit breathed out a word in the Word of God that says, Bring me my cloak. I'm just, what? Like, I know I've said it like three times, but I, 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 what? And I believe the Holy Spirit wrote this so that we can know that there is no job too small if our king is so great. And our enemy will tell you, this is what he'll tell you, you are not visible, no one cares about you, that thing that you served in didn't, didn't help, no one saw it, you are not visible so that you are not valuable and then you become unavailable. And you write yourself out of the story. You are not visible and so you're not, not, you're not valuable, and so you become unavailable, and you write yourself out of the story. There is no job too small. Bring me my cloak. Man, if the king is inviting me, there is nothing beneath me. I wish I had this picture. I've searched and searched and searched and searched so you would believe me, but I just could not find this picture it's really annoying, so you're just going to have to believe me, right? Um, there's, there's this guy, there's this singer, and his name is uh, Jay Sean. Does anyone know who Jay Sean is? Everyone's like, no, I'm a Christian. I don't know who Jay Sean is. Look, he's a rapper. The drink was probably his. Um, kid, kidding, kidding. But he's this rapper dude. He was quite famous for a bit. I think he had one big song, and then he just, like, failed into oblivion. I don't know, right? But anyway, I, w I worked with this guy when I was 18, and he's like, hey, man, like, do you know who Jay Sean is? And at the time, I was like, not a Christian, and I know who Jay Sean... I was like, do I know who Jay Sean is? Like, Jay Sean was like the third song in the club every single weekend. I knew who Jay Sean was, right? And you're like, oh, you sinner. No, no, it's fine, right? And I'm like, yeah, I know who Jay Sean is. And he's like, I went to school with him. I sat in his class. I sat next... I was his friend. And I was like, no, you weren't. You were not his friend. I was like, I don't believe you, right? And then he showed me this picture of him carrying Jay Sean's school bag. And he's like, look, man, I carry Jay Sean's school bag. And I was like, whoa, that's amazing. I was like 17, so don't judge me. I was like, man, you're like nearly famous. You're pretty much famous by association. Like, I think you should print these, and if you sign it, I'll give you $20. And I, I, I wish that was a fake story, but I paid him and I can't find the picture. Because he was carrying Jay Sean's bags and, I, and he, he was so excited to be carrying a famous person's bags 
And, and I want you to know that there is no job too small if our king is that great. Amen. If we as a church can overcome this idea that there are little things and there are big things in the kingdom of God, we will do anything for the king of God, for the king. Amen. We'll do any, there's not little things and there's not big things, there's just things. There's just things. Everyone is so obsessed with the platform. It's not about a platform. It's about people. It's about Jesus. There's not little things and big things. There are just big, they're just things. And if God is going to ask me to hold something, I'm just going to hold it. If, if God is going to ask you, hey, I just want you to hold this little thing for me, man, who am I? Who am I that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is asking me to hold something? Like imagine if Jesus walked in, he's like, Matt, can you just, can you just carry my bags? I'd be like, man, I'll carry your bags. I'll take a picture, I'll hashtag that thing everywhere. You know, <laughs> like I carry Jesus' bags. I think it'd be funny if Jesus, you know, I don't think it'd be funny. There are things that Jesus is asking you to hold. And some of us are like, nope, not that thing. I'm called for something bigger. I'm called for something more. But if we just open our ears to what the Spirit is saying, you will hear that there's something that Jesus is asking you to hold and it is of immense value because of the person asking. It's not about the thing that you're holding, it's the person that's asking you of it. Amen? Fifth and last thing, then we're going to home. The reward of heaven is worth the price of life. The reward of heaven is worth the price of life. Paul said, for, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Man, this is what Paul's doing. He's like, I'm torn. If I live, you get more Jesus. But if I die, I get more Jesus. So if I live, you get more of Jesus. But if I die, I get all of Jesus. I can't lose. I can't, you can't lose. Nero was a king that lost his mind and he started persecuting Christians, right? Paul says here, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. Peter was crucified upside down, right? Paul couldn't be crucified because he was a Roman citizen. And so church tradition tells us that his head was cut off, that Paul was actually beheaded, right? And, he, and, and Paul is sitting there saying, man, if I live, you're going to get more Jesus. And if I die, it's more Jesus for me. So it doesn't really matter what they're going to do to me. You know? And if I'm alive, I'm going to devote my life to bringing people to Christ. I'm going to do everything that he has asked me to do. We are going to build a community that love each other and love Jesus. Amen. We're going to build a building and put Jesus on top of it. And the whole southwest and the state is going to see and experience the love of Jesus. Amen. If I am here, I am going to do as much as I can so people can see Jesus. And if I die, I'm going to see all of him. So it's going to be amazing. But if I am here, I am going to do anything. I am going to do anything short of sin so people know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. Because the reward of heaven, the eternity of where I'm going, of where, what I've been saved from and what I've been saved to is worth my life. And when that shifts in you and that shifts in me, things begin to change. When you put on the goggles of eternity, things begin to change. When you, when you suffer and you go, man, this is like a tiny little bit of suffering compared to what Jesus suffered and I count all glory to him, things begin to change. To live is more Jesus for you. And to die is all of Jesus for me. To live is more Jesus for you. And to die is more Jesus for me. What does this mean for you? 
What does this mean for you? How have you committed your life to Jesus, to bringing people to the light? I see a church full of people who knows what it's like to be sick. I see a church full of people that knows what it's like to be healed. Amen. Amen. I I see a church full of people that know what it's like to be a dark and desperate sinner. And I see a church full of people that knows what it's like to be forgiven and set free. And when you know all of that, when you know all of that, when you know where you came from, where you know you've been saved to, you will do anything, big or small, visible or not visible, to bring people to Christ. Because we will be a church that carries burdens. Amen. We will be a church that carries burdens. We will be a church that turns and sees. Amen. This church will reach people for Christ. And my question is, will you join us? If only you can pray, then just pray for us. If that's the only thing you can do, that is the biggest thing that you can do for us, is pray that we're going to reach people for Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, that usually have this like big finish and this big, woo, whatever. I don't have anything big today. My only encouragement is let's go, church. That's it. Like, let's go. Like, let's go. Like, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Like, who are we? We are Church 242, and we will do anything short of sin to reach people for Christ. Because to reach people, no one is reaching. We're going to have to do things that no one is doing. Amen? Amen? May he get all the glory. May he get all the glory. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. Let's just, let's just praise him for what he is doing. Amen? Amen. Father God, I just thank you, Lord. I just thank you, Father, that you are, you are worth it. You are worth our life. You are worth our heart, Father. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will reign in this place, Father God, and that we will get in your story, Lord. And, and, and we will, Lord, we will commit, Father God, Lord, I just thank you, Father, that you meet us, Father, where we are, Lord. Father God, that if we are broken, if we are desperate, if we are hurting, Father, you are there. You are there healing, Father. You are there offering us relationship. You are there offering us companionship, Father God. And I pray that if there's anything in our heart that's not of you, Father God, anything that we've been holding on for years or for months or for days or for minutes, Father God, that you will help us to be bold, and you'll help us to be courageous, Father, and to bring it to you, Father, in total repentance, Lord. Jesus, this is your church. You are the head of this church, Father God. And we want to bring people to your love. We want to bring people to your life. We want to bring people to your freedom and to your forgiveness, Lord. And we just thank you that we get to be used by you. It's such a privilege. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.
Thank you, Father. You are so, so good. You are worthy. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of our lives. You are worthy of our hearts. We just give it all over to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, we have uh, morning tea down the back, so please feel free to stay and chat and fellowship. Oh, let's have a great week. If you need prayer, come and see us. Uh, and just to let everyone know that there is a river just over there. So if you have small kids, uh, just speak to them to stay away from the river. Uh, and if you want to come to the mystery dinner, there are forms down the back. So sign them up and give them over to Treva.